Consider yourself to be in a conversation with your organization's chief marketing officer. The organization wishes to better understand its customer through data in order to support its business goal and provide a better customer experience. Now, this is one of the situations where clustering comes into play. It is essentially a grouping of objects based on their similarities and differences. This course will teach you how to segment a data set of customers visiting a mall using clustering techniques. Four different techniques, K-means, DB-scan, mean shift and agglomerative will be used and compared. There will be more discussion about algorithm changes and current development. If you are curious to know more about the same, stay right where you are because in this course, you will explore customer segmentation using clustering right from the scratch. So without any further ado, let's get started right away. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new update or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video, show us some love and like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing. So make sure you share this video with your friends and colleagues. Make sure to comment on the video for any query or suggestions and I will respond to your comments. Customer segmentation using various clustering algorithms. Now, as we know about clustering algorithm, when we talk about clustering, first of all, let us try to understand why do we use clustering? What is the purpose of using clustering? So, we definitely understand that it's part of you know, uh, unsupervised learning and so on and so forth. But to set the context of today's session, we would be uh, you know, delve into various clustering techniques. Well, first of all, understand what is clustering and delve into various clustering test techniques. And we'll have a small case study wherein we have a data set you know, of customers who are visiting a particular mall and we would perform a segmentation, uh, customer segmentation on that. And there are many, many, you know, clustering techniques or algorithms which are available. Uh, I have picked up just by happenstance the four of them that is K mean, DB scan, mean shift, and agglomerator. Okay? These are the four which are, and you can go ahead and you know apply other techniques as well on the same data set and uh, work on that. Now, once we apply these techniques, we will try to understand which one is performing better. We, we will basically try to compare, right? which one and what is the basis of it and at the end i would also leave you with some exercise or you know food for thought for you to you know uh, delve into something beyond what we are, we are going to cover today which is in terms of having a proper metric to figure out which one was the best okay or what are the various ways and means to figure out which of the clustering algorithms would have performed better? How do I figure that out? As I was saying, we have learned a little bit of clustering technique, which is part of unsupervised machine learning. But why do we do that? It's applied on unlabeled data set, and that's why we call it as unsupervised. The objective of doing or applying clustering algorithms is basically to find out certain groups, as we say clusters or groups, which are similar in nature, okay? so that there are a lot of similarities within the observations of uh, pertaining to a particular group or cluster, as we say. Okay? And why do we have to have such you know, similar kind of observations uh, or individuals in a particular group? Because they form the basis of multiple application areas when it comes to business. Okay. The most common areas of where the application of clusterings are customer segmentation for efficient marketing or targeted marketing, as we say, image segmentation, document clusterization. So all these are very, very well-known application areas of clustering techniques. Okay. Now, clustering can be divided into two different types predominantly. One is called the hierarchical algorithm 
Uh, there is a partition all over there. Hierarchism is something to deal do with, you know, recursively split the data into smaller subjects, etc. Till we get into, you know, one single observation in a particular cluster. And of course, we can cut short, you know, uh, you know, wherein we would like to have those many clusters and not beyond that, right? And we can look that into you know, with the help of our dendrogram and, and figure out till which point we would like to have or how many clusters do we really love to have, you know, uh, in terms of our number of clusters. Okay. Now, within hierarchical clustering, there is something called agglomerative approach or a divisive approach, right? When I say divisive approach, it's basically a top-down approach, whereas in agglomerative, it's basically a bottom-up approach. Okay? So these are the two types within the hierarchical algorithms in terms of clustering. What is partitional algorithm or partitional clustering algorithms? It's divided. When it, we talk about partitional algorithms, we divide a data set into several subsets based on a given criteria. Now, when we are talking about partitional algorithms, this is little different from the hierarchical algorithms or the hierarchical clustering algorithms, wherein we do not have to define the number of clusters ahead of implementing the algorithms. Like say, for example, in terms of you know, k-means clustering, we let know how many clusters we need when we start you know, uh, implementing them. But again, there are certain algorithms which do not require that kind of a prior intimation that I need to have or partition my data into these many clusters. Right? And one such example could be DB scan. Okay? Now, when we say the number of, or when we define the number of clusters, it is a big challenge in the sense that we require a lot of domain knowledge. Okay? And at times, it becomes literally impossible or extremely challenging in certain application areas to define the number of clusters correctly right at the beginning. Okay? So hence, people have done a lot of research and have come up with clustering algorithms wherein we do not have to define the number of clustering well ahead in time or before implementing the algorithm and the algorithm itself can figure out which is the best suited uh, number of clusters which you can come up with with the given data set. Okay? So this led to the development of many you know, simplified approaches or algorithms which do not require any domain knowledge wherein you have to decide the number of clusters for implementation of the clustering algorithm. Now, saying that, and as I begin with, began with in the session, that there are a vast number of al you know, clustering algorithms which are available. And if you ask me which one is the best, there is no right or wrong answer for that. Okay? There is no single one clustering technique which you know, I can say that this is the best fit. There might be certain clustering techniques which give me a brilliant result on a particular data set, but other algorithms which were supposed to be very efficient, you know, in general, may not perform well for a particular data set. So in that context, what we generally do is we apply multiple clustering techniques okay, with of course certain criteria. And assumptions and based on the results of different algorithms when we compare we choose the best one who is doing the best possible cluster okay and there are certain criteria for that as well now this is a list of a host of clustering techniques and this is not an exhaustive list but these are the ones which i have picked up which can be the or which are the most commonly used clustering techniques. Today, while doing the case study, we will use k-means, dv-scan, hierarchical, as well as mean shift. 
you can very well go ahead and apply the others as well and check which one best fit the, the given data set which we will be used today. But within this four, first four algorithms which we will be implementing, we will try to understand which is the best fit and which is giving us the best result. Most importantly, all that has been list, listed here in terms of the various clustering algorithms can be implemented through the Python library cycle. Yeah, that is very important. One particular library can support all these clustering techniques. Okay. Now, there are certain, as I said, certain assumptions, certain criteria, certain areas of application which they are meant for, you know, which are, so those are kind of thumb rules which help us to choose a certain clustering algorithm. Okay. Say, for example, the key means clustering. When we are talking about a very large number of samples and a medium number of clusters, okay, it's a very general purpose clustering algorithm, which in more often than not gives us a even cluster size, so as to say. Okay. And as I say, you know, uh, it, it's mentioned that it is inductive in nature. That means this particular clustering algorithm can be applied, we can be trained on this you know, training data and also can be applied for an unseen data as well. So that is very important out here. When we are talking about mean shift, it's absolutely not scalable when the sample sizes are large in number. Okay? So this is a drawback for this mean shift you know, uh, clustering algorithm. Okay? But it works with many cluster. If the number of clusters are many, then it works fine, but, uh, and at the same time, if we can have, if we generally have in that, the nature, by the nature of the data set, we may have to have uneven sized clusters. So that also works very fine when we're talking about mean shift. When we are talking about agglomerative clustering, it works on large number of sample size, and of course, the number of clusters. Whereas DB scan, it works very well with very large sample size and the medium number of clusters. This is very, very important. That it should have a very large number of sample size. Okay. Okay. We will see its effect or impact in today's use case when we solve it with the distributed number. Now, there are certain terms which we have used in the previous slide, which is I thought what would be you know worth mentioning out here when we say non-flat geometry cluster. Now it means that it should have a specific shape, right? Non-flat manifold or standard Euclidean listing is not the right metric when we have a non-flat geometry, okay? Uh, geometry cluster. K means uh, you know is a special case for Gaussian mixture model. Wherein, you know, uh, and this is very useful for clustering, wherein we have dedicated to mixture models, wherein the, there is equal variance within, when we say component, it's equal variance of the variables which we are, which are in participation. Okay? Transductive is something which is unseen data or can be applied on the unseen data. On the other hand, inductive cannot be applied in your inductive clustering method cannot be used for the unseen data. Now, as we have seen that in k-means clustering, it says that it's inductive. That means it can be applied for the unseen data as well. Moving on to our first algorithm, which we would have implemented. And this is something which is not nothing new to you. You have already covered that. When it comes to k-means clustering, the criteria with which we build the clusters is something to do with minimizing the within sum of squares of the cluster distance or the distances between the observations. Okay? And that criteria is known as inertia. We try to minimize the within cluster sum of squares. So that is the criteria for the clustering algorithm of K means. Okay. 
when it comes to you know uh, key means algorithm or it, to further add to the key means algorithm it means that we have a suppose we have a set of n samples okay we have a data set with uh, you know n and we have to divide it into key disjoint clusters okay into key number of disjoint clusters okay and the, the, uh, the criteria that is a within sum of squares minimization criteria is expressed mathematically like this okay now inertia can be recognized as a measure of how cohesive the observation how closely bound how closely they are placed within a particular clusters and that is something which we call internally coherent clusters okay? how closely packed the observations are within a cluster okay? the inertia is that measure which talks about the cohesiveness of the cluster the cohesiveness of the observation around the particular cluster okay but on the flip side of the k means clustering algorithm it responds very pure but poorly to elongated clusters when the shape is uh, you know uh, not very you know uh, or uh, convex in nature it's uh, you know say parabolic in nature right and of manifolds with irregular shapes okay so that is where k means does not perform well the k means does not perform well now if you see and i have seen few questions around what do you mean by the shape of the clusters these are the shapes of the clusters okay so if it is elongated if it is not proper in shape then k means clustering does not work well does not perform well does not separate the clusters from each other does not group the observations into specific clusters okay so now if you see this is the shape in which the uh, observations were and when we applied k means clustering it obviously did not cluster well right so this is a mix of two types of observations which are dissimilar in nature but they have formed a cluster right so when we the shapes of the observations are, are such that we which are not of a formal convex shape as we say then k means clustering does not perform well now moving on to db scan when we are talking about the db scan algorithm we this is a little complicated in terms of how it internally works okay? but prima facie it looks into the areas of high density you know how densely populated the op observations are and then they cluster them together okay? that is the core or the basic or the fundamental way db scan works okay? most importantly in db scan can work on any type of shape in terms of the distribution of the data which in other ways you know k means works on convex shape uh, distribution okay? now to understand db scan the central component of db scan is something called as core samples okay Now the samples. Now the, what are what are these core samples? The samples that are areas of high density. That means they are heavily or closely packed in a particular point or a region, right? That they are densely populated there. If they are in of such a nature, then we call them as core samples. There are two main parameters when how we actually. identify core samples are you know minimum samples and and what we called as eps which is nothing but you know the epsilon neighborhood of x what it is epsilon neighborhood the minimum sample and the epsilon neighborhood higher the minimum samples or lower the epsilon neighborhood distance this is the distance measure indicates higher density necessary to form a cluster so this is the basis of how the clusters are formed in db scan okay uh with uh, for uh, forming a cluster in db scan okay now what is this minimum sample and what is this epsilon measure okay minimum sample is nothing but 
the fewest number of points that is required to form a cluster. That is the minimum number of observation that should belong and form a cluster. Belong to a cluster and form a cluster. Below that, it will not form a cluster. So that becomes a criteria for making a cluster. Whereas the epsilon or the epsilon neighborhood is the maximum distance between the two points that can be, you know, uh, that is there between one point to the other while still belonging to the same cluster. So if it is beyond that measure, that distance, then it does not belong to that particular cluster. So while implementing the DB scan algorithm, the, or how the DB scan algorithm works is with respect to two of its hyperparameters or two of its parameters. One is the minimum sample, another is the, the epsilon distance, which is the criteria set is higher the minimum sample or lower is the uh, epsilon distance would actually eventually give you a highly dense number of uh, observation to belong to a particular cluster. Now, as we are talking about the epsilon distance or the epsilon neighborhood, okay, or the epsilon distance for that matter in this case, anything which is at least or greater than this value will become an outlier. Now, this is one of the key feature across all the clustering algorithms, which can identify outliers. That means they do not become part of any of the clusters. Okay? That is a unique you know, feature for a DB scan clustering technique. Okay? Now, we can, you know, we should not be ideally as a best practice, we should not be uh, letting these values as default values, though there are default values as well. But we have to, you know, uh, become, uh, we have to define these, uh, the epsilon values and the minimum sample values. And we will see how to determine these values as well with a simple uh, algorithm uh, or a simple uh, uh, piece of code uh, while we, we do the use case as well. Right? Because these two parameters primarily control how tolerant the algorithm is towards noise. Now, what does this noise mean in this data set? These are noises which would be the outliers in our data set, okay? which would uh, you know, prevent us from deciding or determining or forming the clusters uh, as you say. Now, suppose this is an example for, you know, a data set wherein we have applied the DB scan and these the circles with you know which are larger in size represents the core samples found by the algorithm whereas the smaller circles which you can see here these are the smaller circles are basically are on the fringes of the cluster as we see these are these are at the fringes of the cluster right so these are part of non-core clusters or the non-core samples as we see but there are other observations, which are these black dots, which do not form part of any of the clusters are known as the outliers. Okay? So this is a very unique feature of this DB scan algorithm. Now, when it comes to mean shift clustering algorithm, it, can, it aims to cluster in a smooth density of samples, where the density is pretty even, very smooth across the data set. Okay? And it is a centroid-based algorithm, wherein you know uh, it keeps on updating the centroids once they have formed a cluster. And it's an iterative process, right? And effectively uh, updating the centroid and then again, trying to find out the distances uh, to uh, you know other observations in the sample and uh, within the neighborhood and all those stuff. So it keeps on updating the you know the centroid and forming shift and it's an iterative process and it keeps on iterating till the point when there is no change in the uh, centroid position or the value of the centroid okay? now these centroids may not be or in all likelihood are not part of the given data set 
they are not part of the given data set. That is very important out here. Okay. Now this mean shift uh, clustering algorithm automatically sets the number of clusters. We do not have to bother about what or how many clusters to do and all those stuff. Okay. And again, these parameters has to be set manually, though there are default values, but we do there are opportunities, there are provisions to set them manually as well. But it has all the mechanism to automatically set the number of clusters which the data set, you know, for this particular uh, mean shift algorithm. Okay. Now, there are a few very good advantages for this particular algorithm. It guarantees a convergence. Okay. It will definitely give you the clusters. Okay. We guarantee. Now, the quality of the clusters and all is a question, but it will definitely give you a convergence. Okay. And it will, as I mentioned before, the algorithm will stop iterating when the change in the centroids is negligible. Okay. So that is about mean shift. With respect to hierarchical clustering, I guess uh, most of you know about this, wherein we have you know, the divisive and the agglomerative clustering techniques from top to bottom and bottom to one. From top to bottom is like from a given data set, all the observations till the point they keep on dividing it till each observation becomes a cluster. Okay. The agglomerative is the other way around from uh, one a cluster having one observation and you keep on adding up or you know, it's a cumulative agglomerative way of you know uh, achieving and then we kind of decide where to cut it off in the dendrogram to get the optimal number or the workable number of clusters which aims to address the business problem at hand. Now the key thing out here is the linkage is one is the words method which is the most commonly used word uh, linkage method where it minimizes the sum of the square differences within all the clusters okay? and there's something called a complete linkage, average linkage, single linkage, etc. Each has its own benefits and of course it's uh, you know, pros and cons to this. Now, agglomerative clustering has a nature of, you know, it's very commonly said, rich getting richer kind of a behavior, you know, leads to uneven cluster sizes. Okay? So, this is uh, an area which we'll have to, we need to really look into, you know, when we have a cluster which is growing in number, whereas others are not getting, you know, uh, looked into or the, the size of the other clusters are not. Getting through. so in those cases, agglomerative clustering may not work that well. Okay. Now the affinity cannot be varied with the you know, in terms of the words linkage method. It gives you when we use the you know words linkage method, it gives the most regular size when it comes to the uh, size of the clusters. It's a very it gives me a very even size clusters. Okay. But saying that. If we have, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, outliers as it uses a Euclidean distance, you know, uh, you know, it becomes a little, uh, it becomes a little negative on part of the words method, so as to implement that and give some weird result at some point in time. Okay, so another advantage of using, you know, uh, the agglomerative clustering or the, or for that matter, hierarchical clustering. We can actually visualize the clusters with the help of dendrograms, and this is an exercise which I presume everybody has done it. So, these are the usual libraries which we use, like the pandas, the seaborn, the matplotlib, numpy, and scipy. Let me read the data which is stored in the customer.csv. There are 200 rows and five columns in my data set, wherein there is something called customer ID, a gender, age, annual income, and the spending score. Now, the spending, the scale of spending score, score is between one and 100, right? So, this is a scale which they have you know, come up with. Okay. Now, let us assume that they either, the range of spending is between $1 to $100, say, or it can be $1,000 to $100,000, right? Something like that. So that's us. 
spirits, that means store each one. Now, apart from the gender, all are integer values. This is the summary of my data, wherein I can see that, you know, the mean age is around 39 years. The median age is around 36 years, more or less those. And the minimum age is around 18 to 70. Okay, so the range of my age of the data set is between 13 and 70. The mean of the annual income is around 60,000. And whereas the median is 61, very close to each other again. Minimum income is 15,000 and 137,000. Okay, so we are talking about a mean of spending score, which is 50. Median is also around 50, okay, and it spans between 1 and 90. There are no missing values. Let's do some EDA on the data set first, and then we will look into So I have created some bins so as to understand uh, you know, the age group you know, uh, and their number of males and females within each age group. Okay, So if I see the maximum number of males who are present in my data set belong to the age group of 30 to 35 and 40, right? So these two ranges are between 30 and 40 are the most number of males in my data set. Whereas for so far as females are concerned, the maximum number of females lie between the age of 30 to 35, and then comes 20 to 25, and then 45 to 50. Right? And of course, 35 to 40 as well. Okay. So this is my distribution of males and females in terms of our age. Now, if I perform a kolmogorov smirnov test on the distribution, then I get a p-value of 0.49. That means the average age of the male customers is slightly higher than the females. right? And the distribution of male age is more uniform than the females. Okay? And my kolmogorov sirnov test shows that the difference between these groups are statistically insignificant. It's statistically insignificant because the p-value is high. If p is high, and that is my null hypothesis, which we should, we, have, we fail to reject, and we say that they are statistically insignificant. The difference between the two groups, that is females, males and females. Okay. Now let's look into the percentage of males and females. So out of 200 observations which we have, we have 87 males and 112 females, that is 44 and 56 percent. So it's more on the female side rather than on the male side. Okay. Now if I look at the annual income, the distribution of the annual income with respect to the gender, we see that you know, the number of males who have annual income between 70 and 80 thousand dollars is the highest, okay? and then 60 to 70 and all this stuff. But whereas in case of males, it is 70 to 80, which is very similar to the males, 60 to 70. And of course, 40 to 50. Okay? So we see at the end that at the gender level, if I do a box plot of the annual income, the mean or uh, the median annual uh, income is higher, uh, slightly higher than the mean uh, or the median annual income of the females, right? And that is also significant in terms of the Kolmogorov's of test. Now, if I look into the spending score between males and females, from the box plot itself, it seems they are pretty similar, right? The median spending score is pretty similar, okay? Though it's a little higher on the left side, that is, it's a little left skewed rather than uh, compared to the females, okay? compared to the females. When we are talking about the median annual income <clears throat> of male, male and females, and that is basically the same thing which we have done for various age groups, we have taken the 
median annual income. And this is how it looks like, wherein it gives me the same uh, this thing for the age group of 20 and 30, 30 and 35, 30, 40, uh, 30 to 40, 35, 40, and 40, 45. These are all the higher side, right? And this is on, uh, you know, for the 15 to 20 group, this is also a little on the higher side, but rest remains you know, more or less. This is to 20 to 25 as a median annual income, which is pretty low compared to the others. Rest seems to be pretty even, except for these three groups, which are on the higher side. Now, if we are looking at the Pearson correlation, this thing with respect to my age and the spending score, what do we observe here? Now, let's see the values. Okay. I'm talking about age and annual income. What is the you know, correlation between age and annual income with respect to the gender? Now, this blue line is basically the representation of the correlation or a linear correlation between age and annual income of males and this orange line is basically the linear correlation depicted between age and annual income for the females. Right? So we can, as these are lines which are almost parallel to the x-axis, we can say that there is practically negligible correlation between age and annual income across the gender. Okay. When we are talking about age and spending score across the gender, we see, you know, uh, there is a negative correlation. The slope is negative, right? The slope is negative. A, a slightly negative correlation between the age and the spending score. What me? What does? What that? What exactly means is, you know, with the increase in age, there will be a decrease in the spending. Okay? People around seventy would spend less across both the genders compared to, you know, uh, people around, or uh, customers around who are 20 years old, right? They would be spending more compared to people who are in the age group of around 70 years, right? which is pretty obvious. When it comes to annual income and spending score, it's practically negligible because it's in almost parallel to the x-axis, so practically negligible correlation across the genders as well, okay? Now, if you are looking at, in fact, this is something which we have already seen. This is computation. Uh, okay. Now, let's implement the various clustering algorithms which we were talking about till now. And let's first implement the k-means clustering or algorithm. We are importing k-means from sklearn cluster, sklearn dot cluster. And here we are defining a list of columns from my data set called data, which is the data frame which I have stored my data. And I'm taking the columns age and annual income as well as spending. So this is a list which I'm creating and I'm storing it in X underscore data. Okay. Now, I would like to calculate the various select scores for different number of clusters which we are going to create using the k-means okay? using the k-means and we would store this select code and the cluster inertia in two different lists which are these two empty lists as well as you say one is for the cluster inertia and is for the select score so once we have done that we will plot that so we have the number of clusters in the x-axis and the cluster inertia the y axis. Okay. Uh, this is that elbow method which we have implemented during our k means clustering, wherein we can see that, you know, we, we can clearly see that we have two elbows here, probable elbows here. One is at five clusters and another is at six clusters. So we implement both of them because we are not very sure which one could give me the best result. So we will implement both of them, right? We will have k-means for five clusters as well as six clusters. Okay. And this is the graph for the select score. So we can see that when it comes to six clusters, it gives me the highest select score. Okay. So this gives me a fair idea that we might get a better 
result when we have six clusters. Okay. So let's implement first the five cluster thing. Okay. And for both annual income as well as age. Now, when it comes to age, we hardly see any cluster getting formed. So it's pretty scattered. So we we are not able to form much of a clusters there. It's quite distributed. Yes, it shows formally that there are clusters, but it's pretty uneven and all the stuff. So we cannot say that the okay, means I've done a good job when it comes to age. But when it comes to annual income, we definitely see you know, good results in terms of the five clusters. Okay. Now, how do we interpret these clusters? So, uh, you know, clients with low annual income have high spending score. Low annual income, high spending score, right? Medium annual income and medium spending score. So we can accordingly name each of these clusters, okay? Low income group, low annual income, low spending. So this is another cluster. High annual income, but low spending. High annual income, high spending. So these are the five clusters which are formed. Now let's go ahead and and of course, these are the cluster sizes, which I was talking about. The cluster zero or the first cluster has 23 observations. Cluster one has 79 observations. Two has 39 observations, so and so forth. Now, these are the ways to visualize the same thing <laughs> in a 3D model, okay? which you can visualize it. You can actually turn it around and all this stuff. Okay? Now, I'm going to implement six clusters using K means. And these are the six clusters. And again, we see the same result for the age. <clears throat> the clusters are formed, but not very good enough to actually differentiate between the clusters. So, not a good job. Also. So, here, when we are talking about six clusters, we see a mix in the middle okay? mix of, say, blue and the yellows. So it's not very differentiable out here. So maybe k-means clustering of six clusters is not performing that well compared to what we have seen in five clusters. When we have seen five clusters, it was pretty well defined and well separated, right? But when it came to six clusters, we see that these two clusters are kind of overlapping with each other. These are the cluster sizes as we see. So it is pretty much evenly balanced clusters in terms of the number of observations belonging to each clusters. Okay. Now these are again the visual thing. The next what we will implement is the DB scan. Okay. Now here what we will do is, as there are two parameters to set, okay? one is the EPS values, that is the epsilon distance or the epsilon measure, and another is the minimum sample, the size which we have. And we are, this is something which we are taking it arbitrarily to start with, that is within a range of 3 to 10, and then between 8 and 12.75, you can take any values, okay, <laughs> with the criteria that this should be minimum and maybe this thing, and with a step size of 0.25. Okay. What was the criteria to have a better this thing in terms of DV score? Higher the minimum sample and lower the EPS. Okay. So that is the criteria for choosing the EPS and the minimum sample. So we should have more and more samples in a particular cluster, whereas the distance should be as less as possible. Okay. Now, what we are doing is with respect to the number of clusters and the select score, we are trying to find out the EPS, the best suited EPS score and the number of sample sets. Now, if you see here in this particular you know, matrix, we see that the number of clusters which can vary from 4 to 17. 
4 to 17. That means with an epsilon distance of 8, 8 units, say, with the some sample size of three observations, we can have seven, as many as 17 clusters. And that is how we should read it. Okay? We can have as many as 17 clusters. But if I define it as a minimum sample size as 9, with an epsilon distance of 8, we can have four clusters. Okay? So that's this one measure, one way of looking into this. Then what we are doing is, we are find, trying to find out the select score for a particular EPS and the minimum sample and try to plot this. It's again a hit map kind of a thing. And if I see the highest select score given in this heat map is 0.26. This is the highest what we can have. And this highest select score is for uh, epsilon distance of 12.5 and a sample size of four. So this gives me, if with these two combinations, I get the highest sample size. Now, if you remember, we have had the EPS range from eight to 12.5, right? And the number of samples between zero to one to 10. So what you can play around with is, because we have got the best results for four and 12.5, you can change or play around with that range and increase this further and, you know, bring it, you know, uh, this I probably is okay, I guess, okay? because it's between one and 10 and it's giving me a value of four at the max. But you can definitely go ahead and increase the size of the EPS and check if there is any improvement in any of the combinations with respect to the select score or not. But for this exercise, what we have found out is the select score is the maximum when it comes to uh, EPS of 12.5 units and the number of minimum samples is 4. Okay. So we will go with that and create or apply the DB scan algorithm. And these are my clusters, so as to say. And I have not given you know the number of clusters, so as to say. It has calculated by its own based on the EPS and the minimum sample size, which I have provided with the DBSCAN algorithm. Okay. And it had created five clusters. If you see zero to four, these are the five clusters. And one which is marked as minus one as a cluster is nothing but the outliers. This is a technique, you know, which we use for DBSCAN when we uh, do classify the the outliers and we call that cluster as a minus one. Okay. You could have actually given any name so that you know, we can do it. But most importantly, we see that there are 18 outliers which it has figured out as outliers in my data set which contain 200 observations. But keeping in mind these two parameters, these value of these two parameters. Now if I change these two later based on my select score, what we had done this exercise before, we can have a different number as well here. Okay. Now, if I look at how it is done, so these are the ones. Again, I see it's not performing well with respect to the age, but with respect to annual income, it's performing well. And if you see these small black dots, these are actually the outliers, which it is talking about, 18 outliers as we have done. The small dot, okay. So this is the DB scan thing. Now, when we apply the mean shift, we do not actually have to give anything because it takes care of everything of its own. And if you see, and this time we have not taken the age because for all the three algorithms before that, it didn't work well. So I have only taken the annual income. And this looks pretty well. It has created five clusters on its own. I have not given anything. So it understood the data and I've created the five clusters on its own. And it seems to be a little scattered on this side on with respect to these two clusters. But let's have a look into the size. Yes, the cluster zero has 79 observation, whereas the others were pretty okay. When it comes to agglomerative clustering, 
also gives me almost the same results with five clusters as the mean shift because we have done it for five clusters. Okay, we've done it for five clusters. And then this, these are the tendograms, two different tendograms wherein we are using the linkage method as complete and average in this case. You can use other linkage methods to figure out how they perform. And then we are trying to figure out uh, you know, the various sample sizes or cluster sizes. And these are the cluster sizes. Now, if I bring all the cluster sizes across all the algorithms in a table, what do we observe? Which is the one which is performing the best? When we are talking about k-means clustering with five clusters, these are the ones which are there, but one of the clusters has 79 of such. Whereas when it comes to six clusters, we have pretty much evenly distributed observations across the clusters. So between these two k-means five and six clusters, I would go for k means six clusters okay, as of now. Now let's look at the other ones. DB scan. If you see the DB scan, the first cluster has 112 observations, okay, and 18 are you know outliers. That means it makes 130. Rest 70 observations are part of the remaining four. Wherein there are two clusters, one with eight observations, another with four observations, right? So, which is pretty much not evenly balanced cluster, I would say. When it comes to mean shift, it again performs very similar to you know, the five clusters which we have seen in K-means five cluster, right? In fact, the values are more or less the same. Here you have 22, 23s. Here also you have two 23s. There is a 36, there is a 36 here, there is a 39 here. There's a 39 year, there's a 79 year, there's a 79. Year. So it has come up with the same sized five clusters as we have got for the K means five clusters. Okay. Now, when it comes to agglomerative, this is again not giving me a very, uh, we have chosen for five clusters, right? In agglomerative, if you remember, we have a cluster which is 83, rest all are more or less the same. So what do we conclude here? Now, by far, k-means of cluster size 6 gives me a more evenly balanced clusters. From this exercise, what we have done, but what you can also do is, you can also say that we have done it for five cl clusters on agglomerative technique, whereas Six or K and N or K means rather give me a better result than K means five clusters. So can we try out on the you know aggregation agglomerative technique on six clusters instead and check how does it perform? So here it is 35, 83, 39, 20, and 23. So let me go ahead and change the number of clusters from five to six here. See this. 39, 83, 32, 20, 23, and 3, the one you are right at the bottom, right? Now, if I compare it with this one, this was five clusters, right? So, so let me just move it. Just so it's 39, 83, 32, 20, 23, and 3, right? So, this 3 has been your sixth cluster, okay? Which most probably has come from this uh, 32 or one of these things, right? Because 83 remains as 83. 32, this 35 has become this 32 and three, right? So this cluster has broken down into 32 and three instead of 35. So do you think this was uh, you know, the clustering of an algorithm with six clusters was actually giving me a good result. I don't think so. Because 
it had only the sixth cluster had only three observations, right? So I would not prefer to add a cluster which would give me only three observations rather than I love to have you know, my original five clusters and leave it as is. So out of all these clustering techniques which we have applied so far and have <clears throat> got this result, I would prefer k-means clustering with six clusters giving me a more evenly balanced cluster in terms of the size of the cluster. Okay. Now, why did db scan did not perform well? The most important point out here, if you remember the criteria which we were given across all the algorithm, db scan works extremely well when it works with a large number of samples, a huge number of samples. That is where it kind of understand or kind of uh, has more you know, power to recognize the densities of the observations much better as compared to a much lesser number of observations in that data set. Okay. So this is one of the very good criteria, you know, when it talks about uh, the DB scan, so as to say. But there are other things wherein, you know, the reason why DB scan did not perform well as well is the densities of each of the clusters were varied. And it was more scattered than they were densely populated. So it was not that cohesive by the nature of the data set itself. And if you have seen across all the algorithms, although they have formed clusters, it was not very dense. Okay? And that is where DB scan failed to perform better than the others. So these are the two primary reasons where you know DB scan did not perform well compared to the if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new update or video releases from Great Learning. If you enjoy this video, show us some love and like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing. So make sure you share this video with your friends and colleagues. Make sure to comment on the video for any query or suggestions and I will respond to your comments.